Gentlemen. Right. Um, good morning. Just good afternoon. Uh, they said backstage I wasn't allowed to ask any questions, but I'm going to ask you a question. I'm uh, going to ask a question of the audience. The, um, uh, the topic of this conversation is uh, learning for millennials. Who here would consider themselves to be a millennial? Okay, so we have a few. I wonder what makes millennials different to ordinary people. Um, so let's kick off with that one. But this is supposed to, they say learning for millennials. So what is it about a millennial? Is there anything different to a millennial that they require some different kind of learning experience to ordinary people? Who's well, going to pick that one up? I think, they, I think the environment yeah. in which millennials learn today has changed. It's not that the people are any different, but... You know, my, what's interesting is, is millennials are natives to the technology world that they're living in. They weren't, they're not immigrants like, like perhaps older people might, might consider themselves, right, trying to get used to it. And so when they're kind of born into a world chock full of technology, the, the opportunities around how they learn, I think, is fundamentally different. I think that's one of the big, big changes. So you think, there's some, you think that the technology itself changes the experience of learning. So there's something about technology and learning. I think there. they're more comfortable in learning through technology than perhaps older generations might be. Well, I, and I sure. totally agree with that, but I would say that, so we're, we represent the old guard in some ways. Two you partners with top universities to build really high quality online degree programs. So, uh, you know, people would argue that a Berkeley or a Yale or a Georgetown today can't change uh, and can't sort of offer the kind of active learning a millennial wants, um, there's no doubt we represent, I think, the opinion pretty strongly, self-serving, given that Berkeley and, and Yale and Georgetown can change and provide the kind of learning experience that a millennial wants. The issue I have is that that active learning and that social learning and that desire to be a part of something bigger, be a part of a community of people, you yeah. know, become a Trojan, a Tar Heel, a Hoya, I, I think that has nothing to do with being a millennial. I think the millennials will tell you about it. I think that's the difference. So my, I'm Sorry, Gen X. Millennial, you know, millennials will tell you that. I think millennials will tell you about so it. So millennials are just ruder than, than other people. <laughs> I mean, we, you know, we have a thousand employees and the vast majority are millennials. So from an employer standpoint, there's no doubt that the millennials without question will be more sort of aggressive in telling you what they, what they think. So what it's are, not that they're rude. I think that they're, they're direct. They're direct. direct. I, I should have done what I should have done before launching in was to, I, and forgive me, because the audience will be thinking, who the hell are the, all these people? <laughs> um, was to just get you very, very, very quickly to introduce. We know your name, but introduce yourselves and what your company does. Yeah, I, Aaron sorry. Sconard. Uh, the company is Pluralsight. We do online training for technology professionals. So we right. cover programming languages, IT, infrastructure, design skills, the whole gamut. Brilliant, excellent, thank you. And Matt McGinnis, I'm the founder and CEO at Inkling, and we're a publishing platform for businesses to help educate and train their workforces. And uh, I, I, you I mentioned you. it. You're, we're you're a publicly mind. traded company based in Washington, D.C. My hope is that these two guys join us as a public company because there's basically no <laughs> I don't know public ed tech <laughs> companies. I don't think we're going to fall for that yeah. <laughs> horrible so, Tell us all existence. your secrets on stage now. Right. Um, I want to come on this idea about the technology because, um, uh, Matt, and I'm looking at you here, because, you know, technology has so many times, technology has promised that it's going to make a difference in education and that there's something fundamental so there's something that, that is fundamentally different about modern technology that it allows some great revolution. Uh, I have been to the, uh, 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 a fantastic black museum of educational technology near where I live and, and, and a collection of the worst things that were ever sent out to schools. Um, <laughs> laser discs were going to transform our lives. Um, now, you ran a company, you st your company started doing uh, uh, textbooks on, on iPads, and that didn't work. So what did that tell you? <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so number one, it, well, it, it's very interesting. It told me a number of things. Uh, one is, if you're going to start a company, if you're going to run a business, it's very difficult to address the 18 to 22 segment. They, you know, they don't have a whole lot of disposable income, and I'll tell you, they don't really care about their textbooks. Uh, yeah. It told me that you probably, and you want to really change the education world, the market, 
it's very difficult to do it through the incumbents. And you know, we knew that publishers were going to be technologically backward when we started working with them. I don't think we realized that they would, in some cases, be just outright medieval. It's mind-blowingly difficult to work with. And uh, we've, we've helped them with our technology, but uh, the, the textbook world and, and the traditional methods of education are not going to be changed simply by virtue of the availability of a phone or an iPad, yeah. right? It's far more uh, far-reaching in terms of what we've got to change uh, about how we communicate with people. I think the, the, the single thing we have to remember about where we are today in the transformation around mobile is that uh, you have the entire world's knowledge at your fingertips, in your back pocket, for the first time. The number of people who have access to phones continues to climb in the world, and we're literally only five years into this transformation. Five years. Right. right. So when you think about this on a 50-year time horizon, the kinds of things that we're going to do differently 10 or 20 years from now are going to be so, so much more profoundly different than simply putting a textbook onto an iPad. Well, I, to, to yeah. disagree a little bit, um, we all know each other well. These are, these are two great companies. I mean, we represent, in some ways, the old guard. So I don't know if you guys know Steve Case, the founder of AOL. He's about to come out with a new book that talks about the third wave of the internet and disruption. And, you know, I think that term is overused. But happening in industries that you've got institutional will is the barrier. And I really believe 2U is a great example of a company sort of going through the existing order where, um, you know, the story of change in higher ed is the story of the turtle being mugged by two snails. I mean, it's super slow, but people value their experience at university. And if you can go from within the system and offer a more flexible version of the degree with live instruction, I think we'll look back 20, in 20 years, and it's always dangerous to forecast the future, but I really believe 20 years from now, we'll look back at campus programs as a luxury good. Like, why should you pick, your, pick up your life, quit your job, and move to attend a grad school? It just doesn't make sense. Uh, so I do think that, like, your pivot, I'm yeah. thrilled for you personally that it's worked so well. Um, you know, this is my third venture back startup, and it's the only one that's worked, so I'm not shy talking about my previous lives and pivots. And I would say we've been pretty damn focused on building the world's best degrees from within the system. And I think, you know, we're doing a pretty good job. So we just passed a billion I, in tuition generated. Ben, if I might, yeah, I, no, I, I, think, I think it really depends on the, the topic area to some yeah. degree as well. Because with Pluralsight's focus on the tech skills and the tech space as a whole, um, I think it's changed a lot more quickly than, than perhaps some of these other, maybe some of the, uh, the more mainstream kind of study areas of the past. In technology, I mean, most, I, I would really like to know, like, from the audience, like, how many hiring managers really look at the degree like they did before for the technology specific areas, like for a computer science programmer, you know, does, is that really producing signal that they look at when they make those hiring decisions? And I think, I think, similar, like, we talked about books, I mean, when was the last time a software developer bought a book? You know, I mean, that's dramatically changed over the last 10 to, to 15 years. And so the way people think about learning technology, I think, is maybe further down the evolution yeah. than, than other things. Well, well I, I totally, think, well, I I totally one agree. One counter example of that is that you know, one of our customers is McDonald's, right? And yeah. they're training everyone who runs the deep fryers in their 25,000 US stores digitally through us instead of putting binders and papers and the, the traditional methods yeah. out into the schools. Okay. I know you're talking about sort of the university model, yeah. but I, I think that when you, when you, a burger flipper and a deep fryer at McDonald's is very likely to be a millennial and they don't want to touch a binder, right? Okay. They want yeah. it digitally. But, but so there's no doubt that, that going, I mean, you guys know education. You're not allowed in the no, no, no. It's a tough work. I'll do the I mean, Sudoku, education's I vote with not you. easy to build a big business. Right. It's hard. It's hard. There's no okay. doubt. So I think what we have here, if I can jump in, is, is a, a difference between, so the global topic is education, okay, but actually what you guys deal with is training. And that's actually something quite different. It's a subset of education. Now clearly, you both have, you know, what your pivot has taught, I would guess one of the things has taught you is that training is a more lucrative and profitable area and seems to be a more successful area. And you obviously only focus yeah. uh, in, in training. So do you think, the nature of the difference between training and education. Training is very goal specific. If I, if I go on plural site yeah. because I want to learn jQuery or actually, whatever. I actually don't think of what we do as pure training. I think like training a worker at McDonald's to use the, the fryer is, is more of what I would think of as traditional training. I think of what we do as more of professional learning. So it's, it's the kind of learning that happens within a profession post higher ed. 
um, which, you know, which is different because it is. In what way is that different? Well, it's, it's that you're, I, I mean, mean. It makes it sound a lot sexier. I know that. Well, but. no, I mean, you, you're, when, when someone learns, when we think of lifelong learning, right? Like the kind of education you do in, in university, we actually provide those same opportunities within our library of content and our platform. So it's about deepening those skills, your understanding of the, of the area. It's about mastery as opposed to just learning how to do something, like a, a how-to, click here, click there. We don't do that. And so it's, it's, it is, there is a subtle difference here that's really important to understand. Someone on our platform could actually skip the college degree and learn everything they would learn in a university computer science program without having to pay that bill. Like, they could do that. Okay. So it, it is different. Now, I mean, at the same time, and you, you hire a lot of tech people as well. Yeah. From a hiring standpoint, I think today, if you're at Google, you clearly need somebody that understands the particular programming language. But if you've got two resumes in front of some a hiring manager, and one is simply a certification, and one includes that certification, and they went to Berkeley, they're going to pick that one nine times out of ten. So, and, and I do think that the, the notion of training, where training gets complicated, is like one of our degrees is a Master of Science in midwifery. Midwifery, that's like delivering babies, right? <laughs> So I you don't remember. want to go to the midwife that delivered the virtual I think, bait. I think for a lot of things that's absolutely true, Chip, but I, I don't know that that's actually true for software developers. Well, here's, so here's a question then, Do you, because this is an important <laughs> point. If you look at the structure of education to date, and I, I don't know the US system, I'm relatively familiar with the Irish system, and obviously having been through the UK system, I know it well. You get, you get examined at, well, the UK, you get examined about every three weeks, but um, you get examined at, there's formal exams at 16, 18, and then you have a bachelor's degree at you know, whatever it is, 21, 22. And there's nothing in between any of those things. There's no, there's no fine level of certification. So if I go on Pluralsight and I, and I take a course in, you know, Python or whatever, whatever yeah. it is, where's the evidence that I can then yeah, go to Google, Cisco, blah, blah, this, car, this, whoever it is, yeah, and say, this, I can do this? This is the whole new trend that's, that's evolving now around skills level credentials. And, and these, these different forms of online credentials that never existed in the past. And they are taking on a lot more meaning and value to both the individual as well as the hiring company. We have 12,500 enterprise customers around the world who use Pluralsight internally, and they're now looking at individuals that show up at the door and looking at their Pluralsight credentials that they bring with them. And so it, Pluralsight's not the only form of credential, but there is, there's this new wave of online credentials that are now emerging that are going to take on um, you know, just as much meaning long term as, as a traditional college degree, I believe. I mean, I believe, Matt, because yours is done internally, and you know, if I'm McDonald's, I, I have the certification. I have the thing that says, this is the person who took that exam uh, or that went on that course, and this is what they achieved. So I mean, for other people, how do you get around this problem? Because there are two issues there, which is, is the person who's holding the, certif the certificate the person who took the exam? Um, <laughs> and, uh, and secondly, you know, is that thing of use? So presumably when you're dealing with enterprise customers, that's one yeah, of the Yeah, I mean, there's certification and that sort of thing on the job. I think what's, what's interesting about the shift in higher education is that we need people who know how to learn. You go to university nowadays to learn how to learn. And my opinion is that when I see, you know, we're talking about millennials in this panel, when you see someone who says they're 20 years old, they dropped out of school because it wasn't worthwhile, they didn't think they were getting anything out of it, that says as much about their attitude as it does about any particular skill. I value people who went to Berkeley or who went to some university not because of the skills they bring to the table, because I guarantee you they have no, basically no useful skills coming in as a 22-year-old. Uh, but they have an attitude that they were able to get through those four years. Yeah, absolutely. Then I can take them over to Pluralsight and I can say, okay, you're going to be an engineer, go learn Python because we use, we use Python and they're going to be self-paced and able to learn what they want. And then I say, you're not good enough to program in Python, you're going to go so make a deep frying french fries joke, which I'll I think this is on tape, so I'm not going <laughs> to make the joke. But, um, you know, the, 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 the bringing together of the attitude uh, with the, the attitude of a, of a quote-unquote millennial, the idea of impatience and not being willing to subject yourself to the sort of traditional approach to this stuff. There, are, of course, maybe some merits in uh, rethinking how we put people through a system, but this is, this is much less about the technology and more about an, a, a human being's ability to learn with I, that I, technology. I, I, so I just want to pursue this idea of where we think 
this change is, go is going to happen because all of you have been talking about, um, you know, yours is tertiary education, yours is post-tertiary education. I mean, you're claiming that you could replace tertiary education. So you're dealing with, you know, people who are 21 plus uh, um, or, or maybe 18 plus. Do you think that's the most fruitful area or do you see that technology, you know, as this is, as they say, is, is, is learning for millennials. Learning doesn't start when you're 18. Um, do you see that technology can have an impact on what, the, what you in the U.S. would call K to 12, absolutely. primary and secondary? I mean, it, it, it will absolutely go Why? all the way down. Because so far, time. nothing has happened. I don't, I don't really agree, actually. In ed tech, there's some really interesting things happening at the K-12 level yeah. that you haven't seen before. And there's also a ton of failures, but that's venture capital. I mean, I feel like people overstate how much money has gone into venture capital at ed, ed tech. Uh, you know, just to put it in perspective, last year, uh, more went into Uber than into all of ed tech. So, yeah. you know, and, but the reality is venture capital creates opportunities. Like, we raised a lot of venture capital. You've raised a lot of venture capital. Um, but it also creates uh, failures, that by definition. There is, there is change happening. I really believe that, like, you know, the, the train has left the station. Like, Burke, I mean, everyone would have told you, I, eight years ago when I started the company, people told me we were crazy. There'd be no great schools that would offer online degrees. You know, we've got Yale, Berkeley, Georgetown. They're all excellent universities. So I think if an institution like Yale that's been around since 1701, I mean, our our youngest brand, SMU, is 12 years older than Walt Disney. Like, companies don't last this long. So if those kind of institutions can change, it, it, there's no doubt in my mind it'll go all the way down. Now, I'm not doing K-12 because I learned a hard lesson in my previous life, the value of focus. Like, you know, as a young entrepreneur, couldn't help myself, bright, shiny object, but, constantly but doing things. So to you, we stayed pretty focused. Is there not something, and this is a question, not a statement, is there not something fundamental about the teaching experience that it requires a human input? I think humans are really important, uh, absolutely. And we love what to use doing because they're using technology to basically increase accessibility to these wonderful humans and, and teachers around the world at their, at their universities. Um, you know, Pluralsight goes and we find the human beings around the world that are experts in all these technologies and we basically package them up into this library resource that, that can be accessible at scale. And then we try to allow our learners to connect with mentors around the world in real time as well, to get help on the fly. And you've got so, some of them making huge okay, so incomes, they, so, right? So in plural, yeah. I can have a real-time conversation. That's with, right. This is a new okay, element that, that we actually just brought into the platform oh, within right. the last uh, quarter. Um, it's really exciting. We've always believed that there's something about the human connection, this emotional connection that you need yeah. with a human being to get through like learning challenges. And even Salman Khan's vision for K-12 includes you know, um, you know, you have the library of content that so people can move at different paces, and that's really where the technology can help, is helping them know, how, basically, how can different people move through yeah. with adaptive kind of guidance, right? Yeah. And, then, and then have the humans there to kind of, to help and mentor and, and, and be part of that experience, which I think is pretty critical. Well, I mean, online education has a confidence problem. I mean, the issue, preconceived notions of online education are just terrible, yeah. because it's not been very good. Because for most the, of its the history, has been, have been well, no, you know, the, experience, the experience has been bad. You know, the reputation, right. it's not, you know, no brand name associated with any yeah. of these programs. I mean, and it's been, it's been pretty bad, but guess what? This is not like what you guys yeah. do is not your grandfather's version of online education. Right. It's just not. I mean, today you can have an active, live, real experience where you're learning anything from data science to how to be an accountant to how to be a midwife through a very I really, I, I've got to check out this midwife class. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty sweet. <laughs> well, and this, I think this is really what was different you about have to millennials. Deliver 30 babies to graduate. Because millennials were kind of born into this, into this generation, this world that's filled with technology, they're more comfortable actually going out and seeking these learning opportunities. And I think that's really what's different. I really do. I mean, I, I you know. It's self-directed. It's self-directed. They're, they're, they're hungry for it, and they're not afraid to go use technology to learn things. Well, it's an interesting idea. Uh, um, we got the red light. We have, we have got the red light. Now, just there was one fact I wanted, I promised that I would, I would, I would put in front of the audience, which was, this is an absolutely incredible. Just show you how, how you're all, uh, all of you t techie people, what was the highest, you, you, so your mentors, your, your instructors on yeah. plural site, because yeah. we're, we're running over time, tell the audience how much the highest paid person, the highest paid men, uh, instructor earned 
last year on Pluralsight, because it will blow you away, and you will all want his business card. Over a million and a half dollars. So he earned a million and a half dollars yep. by being an instructor. Yep. There isn't a high school teacher in the world that's earned that. <laughs> um, on that optimistic note, uh, I don't think I did anything. Um, but these three, I think, deserve a fantastic round of applause. Thank you very much indeed.